the second half of the second day of the summit. I would like to underline cybersecurity once again. A global brand, Komodo, a cybersecurity brand, has an advertisement to show us. Under sponsorship of global investments, we will go on with the panel titled New World Order and Future. We have Reza Kami, chairman of the Turkish Iranian Business Council, Frederick Reinfeldt, former prime minister of Sweden, Janos Papantoniou, president of the Center of Progressive Policy Research and former minister of finance, Dr. Ibrahim al Raji, CEO of al Raji Holding Group, and the moderator is going to be Erkut Yücoğlu, the chairman of MAP and Turquoise Group's board. Thank you. Also, Mr. Rauf, I would like to thank you. This is a great summit, although I am participating for the first time, it's noticeable. And as you might have realized, this session is going to be highly international. And the topic that was allocated to us is really broad. And I thought of a specific time period to talk about, but probably this topic could span over the next 20 to 30 years. The current revolution might probably cause a new world order to arise, and we will discuss this. Before our panelists, I will kind of provoke their thoughts. We have been talking about brandization, digitalization, and how global brands can be born out of a country. There were gurus we have listened to, and mainly we were talking on an optimist tone. Professor Jürgen Randes authored a book which was titled Borders of Growth 2052. In this book, Professor Randes says, the world population is going to increase to 8 billion, and it will be stagnant at around that level by 2050, because both increase in population and deaths will balance each other. That is after 2040. Well, we are concerned about the booming population, but the professor tells us that it will stop at 8 billion. There are implications. Foodstuff production will be diversified, but prices will go high. New water sources will be covered, but some parts of the world will go deserted. He also tells us that consumption patterns are going to follow an increase in crop, but there is going to be 
high consumption of energy and electronic goods. Also, according to him, oil consumption will diminish following 2025, and that is only 10 years from now. According to him, renewable energy usage is going to increase, and gas as well as coal will be commodities with lower demand after 2030. And on the contrary, we are fighting to build pipelines which are based on these commodities. Probably we should change our perception. As I have already mentioned, if oil need is going to diminish after 2025, what is the fight for? These are points that are optimistic for the future, but there is also another pessimistic point the professor made. It is about climate and global warming. According to him, by 2050, the limit that we have projected, which is two to three uh, degrees of temperature increase, is not going to stay at that, he concurs. And this means about 25 cities of the world will be submerged in water. By the way, the world of medicine was not really mentioned so much in this meeting. As you know, genome research has been continuing at full speed. And underlying reasons of diseases are now being uncovered before they even occur. Cancer treatment, according to him, is going to improve, and the average lifespan of a human is going to be about 80 to 100 years. Again, according to him, biotechnology companies will leave behind conventional medical companies. In the meantime, new expertise fields will emerge. We have been talking a lot about the digitalized world, but I have to add something which was not mentioned. Social media is now becoming an important power over political preferences, and this will only increase in the future. And even media enterprises are going to utilize social media to come into contact with the audience. A lot can be said about global politics, but the professor says, although there won't be a world war, regional conflicts are going to grow further. New growth actors are going to emerge, according to him, and there are some other interesting points that he makes. These are sometimes tied to the technological advancements, which we have mentioned. Some of them, on the other hand, will hinder technological advancement. These are some of the insights I provided. When I was selected as the moderator, I had a problem because the topic would most probably be digitalization, and thank God it isn't, because I don't have much information about this topic, as I am uh, an old businessman. Recently, my sons even wanted to hire a mentor to teach me about computer usage, about usage of iPhone, iPad, all those smart and digital devices that are popular today. They even wanted to tutor me. Actually, a young tutor was hired. He came to my office. He started teaching me. At some point, though, I thought I was being left behind. I started talking to him. I stopped him from talking. And I provided to him my own insight about coding languages like Fortran. I mean, I talked about the earlier dawn of computerization. And he was really interested. Then my son was in the room. He came without us realizing, and he was really surprised that I was tutoring the tutor, the young person that he hired, to teach me about computers. So when I was invited to the session, I was kind of surprised and concerned but thankfully, I'm not going to talk about digitalization. So now it is time for our panelists, who are all valuable participants. First of all, I would like to introduce Reza Kami, the chairman of the Turkish Iranian Business Council. Throughout his life, he has been working in the private sector, 
and he is going to speak in Persian language and probably invite you to doing business in Iran. Sohanjan, <laughs> تنش های فراوان و اثبات صلح آمیز بودن فناوری هسته‌ای وارد دوران جدیدی شده که حاصل گفتگو و تعامل سازنده بوده که می تواند الگوی خوبی برای منطقه و جهان باشد آنچه ما بین ایران و پنج به اضافه یک تحقق یافت نشان داد که می توان با دنیا حرف زد و با منطق افکار عمومی دنیا را تحت تاثیر قرار داد و با کوتاهترین And as soon as possible, after this period of lifting embargoes, we are going to benefit from this new business environment because we have cleared up new space for new opportunities. And the environment is far different than in the past. Right now, we are seeking ways of communicating with the rest of the world and attract capital. This will, we realize, require us to employ modern technology in our country with the help of academicians. We will try to equip our country with new means of technology, and our country is really ready. Both our public and private sector are ready, and the state is offering all incentives required for foreign investors to come and join us over there in Iran. Supporting the private sector and improving the commercial environment and lifting obstacles in front of entrepreneurship are going to form the main axis of Iranian economy in the future. We realize this fact because it is necessary in order for us to communicate and work with international partners. This new environment has to be ready to attract technology and investments. Some of the potential areas of investment in Iran involve energy and petrochemicals, for example. When it comes to commerce and industry, maybe our region is not really well known to outsiders. However, there is potential also in the industrial arena and internationally operating businessmen will most possibly find something to do. About 5 million people will be graduating from Iranian universities very soon, which means we have a young population, qualified population, and about 580,000 industrial experts are ready waiting for their international collaborations in Iran. We have set a goal of 8% of growth rate in our next development program. This will be hopeful, probably, for investors because it is an indication that we require billions of dollars of investment and some portion of that might as well come from foreign investors. According to research run by economic analysts, Iran is going to undergo serious transformation very soon. Therefore, the Iranian market is going to be an area where most countries which are renowned for their 
uh, investment capabilities are going to be competing for Iran and investment areas. In previous years, especially during the embargo years, Turkey has been standing really close to Iran. So I believe Turkey could be one of those top investors in commerce, industry, textile, automotive, tourism, logistics, petrochemicals, transportation, packaging, steel processing, electronics, and electronic devices, and even paper production, Turkey could find a lot of opportunities. Likewise, in the field of copper processing and valuable as well as semi-valuable minerals shall be areas open to investment. There are already some projects which are envisioned for the future. We are only waiting for some global partners to join us. Iran, like your country, is a bridging nation between the north and the west and between the east and uh, the west, as well as north and south, I am correcting. Our airlines are operating efficiently and they offer flights to a lot of places. Transportation, on the other hand, suffers from lack of proper equipment. At the moment, for example, we have 750,000 trucks which are really old and should be renewed and replaced. This is another field where we require investment and projects are being developed again. They are defined and we are waiting for investors. According to the projects we have defined so far, annually we will require about $15 billion of investment in order to finally refurbish our transportation infrastructure. This includes both railways and road transportation as well as air transportation. In the upcoming years, Iran is going to be ranking among top industrial countries. This is our objective. So as I am being warned about my time, I would like to conclude for now by inviting foreign investors once again. Thank you very much. I would like to apologize because I interrupted uh, in your speech, but this topic can go even longer. Right now, I would like to yield the floor to Frederick Reinfeldt. As you all know, he is the ex-prime minister of Sweden. And between the years of 2006 and 2014, he uh, established the center-right coalition with the uh, four, four parties, and he won the elections uh, consecutively, and he provided a welfare for the Sweden indeed, because during those times, uh, we know that approximately 300,000 to 400,000 new jobs has been created and the Swedish economy received a good competition edge. Maybe he can give us some recommendations about uh, their success stories. But uh, I would like uh, kindly uh, like to ask him where the European Union is going on. If you can speak about this issue, we will be appreciated. And in addition to that, you know there is that transatlantic trade and uh, investment. Uh, partnership is being negotiated, but this TTIP will bring to the Europe. These are the topics, but only in eight minutes, please. Well, uh, thank you very much. And um, you started by referring to a Norwegian professor, and I just want to state that I think uh, that professor is wrong. Uh, not wrong in everything he um, taught us about the future, but I think his prediction that the world population will stop at 8 billion is wrong. I think it will grow even further. Even though it's very difficult, of course, to predict the future, but looking at the UN system, they are talking about at least 10 billion people in the world by 2050, and even as much as 11 billion, which increases the tensions that you mentioned on energy, on food, and probably also on security. 
I think the interesting thing, though, with a world population that is growing, is that it is with one exception, and that is Europe, because the population of Europe will be shrinking. So we are the only part of the world that do not foresee an increase in our population. I think this is, uh, should be more reflected in the discussions in the Europe of today. What kind of future uh, are we heading towards with the European Union, given the fact that uh, a very small portion of the world population, sometimes said to be 10 down to 7 percent inside Europe, actually um, gives themselves half of the world cost when it comes to welfare ambitions. And of course, with this change that I'm indicating, that might be even tougher in the future. So, the world population is not growing when it comes to Europe, and we have an aging population which ages very quickly. So in this atmosphere, we now have a discussion then on European Union. Where are we heading? Well, I think this year, the probably most important decisions will be, as you have seen, regarding migration, where the agreement with Turkey is, of course, very important for Europe. But the second also very big discussion and decision will be on the United Kingdom if they are to leave or stay inside the European Union. That will be taken on the 23rd of June of this year. I think that, and for my sake, it's of, it's of utmost importance that the United Kingdom stays inside the European Union. I think it's important for Europe. I think it's important for the United Kingdom, actually. Um, and I think it also points to the future. If it's uh, Europe that stays together, or if it's disintegrating uh, into the future. As you might, might well know, there is a discussion in the United Kingdom that if they are to vote an out decision to leave uh, the European Union, it's foreseen that Scotland might leave the United Kingdom. So it's a kind of falling out where the United Kingdom leaves the European Union and Scotland leaves the United Kingdom. And we have the same kind of discussions if you look to Spain, where they had the Catalans would like to have a referendum on leaving Spain. So in many parts of Europe, you feel uh, a risk of falling apart and putting in place regional values and an increased nationalism. Nationalism in a way that is bad. There is, of course, also good things with nationalism, but what you see here, I would say, is the kind of old-fashioned, more aggressive nationalism that has led to, to so many problems for Europe in the past. So this is a very important decision, because what we are trying to achieve, and very interesting uh, to listen to the opening up of the markets in Iran, but of course that points to the future. A lot of these markets that are open up in Iran, that could also be said for many other parts of the world, these investors we talk about are very often coming from Europe. It's European investors moving into these areas, and I can say that when the deal was struck with, with the United States, there was a lot of business interest in Sweden saying that this is very interesting. Let's now try to get into Iran and be part of opening up that society. Europe has these tools. It has foreseen that trade, not only with products, should also be increased to services, and very importantly, with what our moderator said, also when it comes to digital agenda. Um, it is said that the kind of single market that we have had for products and free movement of people should also apply to services and digital purchases. And of course, I think this relates to job creation in the future. This is where you need to be. This is where you need to be competitive. But of course, to create that, you need to take away a lot of obstacles a lot of tariffs, a lot of taxes that are used to uh, stop and hinder a lot of this trade to uh, happen. And these barriers are still between European countries, but it's also very true that it's between continents. And therefore, one of the other very important issues, as you indicated, is the free trade discussion between European Union and United States. This is actually now coming to an end because it's been ongoing talks for a long time. 
So they are soon to have their last talks coming into the toughest areas, which everyone knows will be agriculture, because when it comes to agricultural products, we tend to be very uh, protectionist against uh, products coming in from other countries. This is also true for Europe and United States. And also the kind of procurement where you can actually trade in doing business for government entities, which is also a very tough item. So these are not solved, but it is foreseen that this will be ready at the end of this year. Actually, this will be waiting for the incoming president, then be it Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. I think this is very important because they are now chasing each other to be mostly against this TTIP. If you listen to the presidential candidates in the United States, they talk against free trade. Surprisingly enough, most voiced by Donald Trump, that comes traditionally from the party in the United States that is supposedly more pro-free trade, but he's definitely not. That's where you heard that he wants to build this wall towards Mexico and throw 11 million Mexicans out of the country. That's not free trade to me. That's, well, troublesome. And it will not work. But still, the new administration, the new president of the United States will be very important in the decision that we need, and Europe needs this as well. If we get this free trade agreement, if we take down barriers and take away a lot of the obstacles that are out there, then you have more free trade for half of the today's world economy. And of course, in that atmosphere, you will be able to create jobs. So I would say that this year alone, you will face most of the de facto important decisions that will point to the future. Will we have a Brexit, a disintegration of Europe? Will we have a US president that is actually more pro-trade than they sound now as candidates, because in that you will see if we have the opportunity to create jobs for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Now we would like to hear from uh, Minister Yannos Papa Antonio, uh, who has been in Greek politics for a long, long time. Uh, and has, has held several ministerial positions. Uh, he has his uh, doctorate from London, uh, and he's now uh, president of the Center for Progressive Policy Research. Efendim, bunu İngilizce okudum, kusurunuza bakmayın. Çünkü süratlendirmemiz gerekiyor şeyi. Çok kısa... I would like to apologize. I read your CV in uh, English. Uh, very briefly, I would like to say that in 1999, together with Mr. Janos Papantonio, I had a chance to meet with him in Athens, because at those times, the Tusiat was visiting many uh, of the uh, centers in all around the Europe, and the Tusiat had started a campaign in order for Turkey to be accepted to the European Union. We went to the Papandreou, and last we went to Janos Papantonio. And by the way, I had to say that he supported us uh, very much, and I would like to thank him for his support. Uh, we went out of his room, and 50 members of the press were waiting for us, and they were shouting, how uh, can it be possible? How can you do this? But I have to say he supported us to the end. You don't have any specific uh, question to me, I can... No, uh, I think you should also evaluate the situation in Europe for us. Yes. Uh, but I do have to tell you, you have only about seven, eight minutes. <coughs> all right. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this meeting. And uh, frankly, uh, I'm very happy I came here because uh, it has been some time uh, living in Greece that I have seen such a dynamic and confident audience, which is in heavy contrast to what, what, what happens in my country nowadays. In other words, uh, I feel that I'm the reverse coin of uh, Mr. Reinhardt. He is the successful side of Euro, the Eurozone. I represent the less successful side, although I should say uh, that uh, I was minister, in fact, the longest serving one, 
in uh, supposedly good years from 93 to 2001 when Greece acceded uh, to the Eurozone, which despite all, the, all its faults, it is now a support for, for, for, for Greece. Before uh, commenting upon the Eurozone, I would like to say two things about the global issues. Of course, the world faces an enormous amount of problems, in particular climate change, digitalization, various technological changes which pose great challenges to governments. But I would like to single two problems as the key ones. The first is that globalization increases interdependency, interconnection. And this interdependency makes the need for coordinated action much more pronounced than was the case 10, 20, or 30 years ago. Evidence of this is the uh, international monetary crack of 2007-8, which was more severe in, uh, than any other crisis over the last 60 years. And the reason was that the, that the world was not ready to handle such huge globalized crisis. This is a lesson for the future that we need to reinforce global economic governance. We should increase international economic coordination, including through trade agreements, including through a reinforced role of the International Monetary Fund, and of course the G20 of which Turkey is a member. The second uh, single issue I would like to raise about globalization is it tends to increase inequalities. It does increase inequalities because uh, over time, as Piketty, for instance, has noticed, the French economist, the rate of profit is, tends to be higher than the rate of growth. So at, out of any single volume of production, the share of profits, the share of rich people, grows over time. And this trend is interrupted, is uh, disturbed, so to speak, only in times of total war over a global crisis like the Second World War. Then capital is destroyed, and the share of capital income decreases, but then resumes its rising trend. Have you not noticed that in the States, the great majority of white uh, uh, manual workers are behind Trump, and this reflects a single fact, that their incomes is stagnating for 30 years, while the share of the 1% wealthiest Americans has doubled or tripled over the same 30 years. So if we do not address the problem of inequality globally, and of course this is not by disrupting trade agreements, but it is by raising taxation on the wealthy people, is uh, uh, uh, applying more smart social policies to address need, and of course to uh, spread the free trade and spread uh, uh, global aid to help the less developed nations, then this is the recipe for global revolution, so to speak, for, a continuing, for continuing social and political problems, instability, and the emergence of more Donald Trumps around the world. And now turn to Europe. Now, the lesson of, of the European unification is that uh, unification intensifies the transmission of crisis. If you're a single country and you default, then it is mainly your own problem. But if you belong to the economic union, then your problem is transmitted to others because your interest rates rise, then you have, they have to save you, and then the, uh, this crisis spreads. And Greece's debt crisis in 9 and 10 has spread throughout the Eurozone precisely because was, Greece was a member of the European uh, economic union. If it were Argentina, it wouldn't really matter. So if you start walking in the federal route, you have to go to the end of the way, as the United States has done. If you stop uh, uh, ahead of, of, of the end, then you run the risk that all these risks of defaults and economic crisis accumulate and then cannot be handled by the whole of the Eurozone and the whole edifice collapses. You have noticed perhaps that uh, some uh, British economists uh, with some uh, joy or hidden joy, notice that, uh, well, the European Union will soon follow the fate of other experiments of multinational unification, such as the Austro-Hungarian Empire, such as the Soviet Union, or such as the former state of Yugoslavia. This is a real danger. So more unification is the need, is the recipe that must be applied in Europe today, both economically and politically, to face the crisis and become less vulnerable to shocks. The problem, of course, is 
that uh, since uh, the uh, global economic financial crack of 2009, uh, 7 and 8, and precisely because all these inequalities grow, the authority of governing elites in Europe and the world has diminished. And the rise of Donald Trump and others, and Marine Le Pen in Paris and others, uh, signifies this, this fault. So instead of having enlightened, so to speak, in quote-unquote leadership, we have a rise of populisms and nationalisms. And this is also very true in Europe. Given this trend, it is unlikely, my dear friends, that Europe takes the right decisions uh, in the immediate future, at least. So if you ask me if I'm optimistic about the future of the European Union, I would simply say no, I'm not terribly optimistic. Of course, I don't see a total collapse, but I would see rather a trend, uh, a, a European Union surviving with difficulty, continuing to be very vulnerable to shocks such as the current migration crisis and such as the recent debt crisis, and uh, uh, eventually uh, dividing itself into a multi-speed Europe, a core unifying more according to the model I suggested, another perhaps uh, periphery around it, and the third periphery to which also I see, I would see more easily a role for Turkey. Because I open a parenthesis here since I have been a very strong supporter in Greece, despite many uh, much opposition to its Turkish position in Europe, and I believe in it very, very strongly. I think that 10 or 15 years ago, when the moderator visited me in my office, it was a more realistic prospect than it is now. Now, you should realize that you are so big and you grow so fast that Europeans are afraid of you. So, I don't think it's very realistic to expect that Turkey will join the core of Europe, particularly in a multi-dimensional Europe. But it is still very realistic to expect, following, for instance, the status of Britain with many opt-outs, that Turkey can reasonably aspire to be part of a wider circle within the European Union. And this is, I think, what will be mutually very useful for both sides. Europeans will be calmer, having Turkey at a distance, and Turkey will feel that it does belong in the European family, as has always been its history. Now, concerning Greece, uh, if I have a, a moment now, two, two, minutes. two minutes. Uh, well, in those two minutes, I will <laughs> speak about two things. Greece prospered when uh, two things happened. The first was political stability, inspiring confidence, and granting investment. And second was reforms. Now, both these things now have collapsed. Political stability is out of the question. In six years, we had five governments of very, very low quality. The, the last one is the worst, unfortunately, and the most populist one. And secondly, uh, reforms have stalled over the last 15 years. And the reason why Greece is in such a dire state is the absence of, this, of these two things. Now, if you ask me again, if I think that my country will soon recover political stability and competent government and uh, uh, restart the reform path, I would also say <laughs> that I'm not terribly optimistic because I don't think that the political system of Greece, as, is, as it is now structured, is able to undertake this, this very heavy weight. However, a lesson I have learned during the long years I've been in politics because I joined the European Parliament at the age of 30, so I, I, I have some experience, is that politics is uh, more than anything else unpredictable. And nations out of the ashes sort of have a rebirth and they surprise everybody. Who could uh, have expected that uh, Germany after the tragedy of Nazism, will become the most successful, democratic, and economically powerful European country. So let's hope, let's hope for Greece, and let's hope for Europe. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Şimdi efendim, Dr. İbrahim Abdülaziz al Raji Bey'i size takdim etmek istiyorum. Kendisi, bir iş adamı ve bütün ailece senelerden beri özel sektörde büyüyerek e, gelişen bir grupları var. E, saymakla bitiremeyeceğim ama kendisi Alraji şirketlerinin yönetim kurulu üyesi 
Ayrıca TİBA Airport Operation Company'nin yönetim kurulu başkanı, El Arab Contracting Company yönetim kurulu üyesi, General Enterprise Trading Company yönetim kurulu başkanı. Böyle gidiyor efendim liste. Fakat en son kendisi zannediyorum, yanlış bilmiyorsam TAV kuruluşumuza da yönetim kurulu üyesi olarak e, girdiler. E, Doktor El Raşi sizden ricam şu. Petrol fiyatları nereye gidiyor? Petrol fiyatları adeta gelişmiş pazarlarda bir endeks haline geldi. Bir de bölgedeki gelişmeleri ve fırsatları nasıl görüyorsunuz? Ha, bu arada e, 8 dakikanız var. Selamun Aleyküm. Before I start my speak, I think I will not answer about the oil prices because our friend yesterday said it will be zero. So the answer is already uh, there. Uh, I will go for, um, I would like before I start to address maybe two uh, important things. When I talk about um, the region in, in my speech today, I'm trying to identify it between Turkey in, in the west, uh, in the east, up to Egypt in the uh, west, while Syria to Yemen from north to south. Just that is the region where I would like to focus because I think uh, the purpose of my, my uh, speak is in, in that region. And also I would like to go back to the Arab Spring, which is five years back, which is very important in the events and the effects of these events in the economy and the countries. Uh, which is um, becoming quiet in some countries or stable while it is extremely hot or war in some of the countries like Syria and Yemen. And we all know about these events and the conflict or the uh, uh, different of opinions between some countries in the region like uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, Uh, Turkey and other other countries without going in, in the political side because maybe I'm the only one from the not from the politician here uh, I would like really to focus on the business side um, We saw the involvement in Saudi with the alliances in Yemen and we see the influence of Turkey or the effects of Turkey in Syria because the stability of, of Syria is very important for uh, uh, Turkey and in the fact Turkey lost Uh, a very important uh, business because uh, our business is trade with Syria due, due to the war. And so all that ended up maybe uh, in, in the last few months we heard about the 34 Muslim uh, countries uh, form an alliances uh, uh, against anti-tourism and the headquarters in Saudi Arabia and, and Riyadh. Um, the, the, the message I want to say here is How, how these events and how these crises affected the economy and, and the country, and how the leaders of these companies or countries deal with that. Because these events will never stop. Either it will increase or decrease. It will continue for four years in the same patterns. However, the importance in, uh, and the relation of your country will be affected. I will give two simple examples, or maybe st two straightforward examples. No, the number one, example, which is the relationship between uh, Turkey and, and um, Iran. We all understand there is around 14-15 billion trade between uh, US dollars between Iran and Turkey. And uh, the relationship, it's, it's very important. Knowing the fact also Turkey and Saudi Arabia, they have that relationship. And we all understand the complication between the, the three countries. So the, the, the leadership is important to reduce or eliminate the effects of these um, uh, uh, political events or these uh, crises to the economy, to the company, and of course for the population or for the people in this country. Another good example which I would like to use, which is uh, co company to company. When we, when we worked um, or when we signed an agreement with TAV Holding in 2009, Um, during that time, from 2000 to 2009 until 2015, uh, the relationship between Saudi and Turkey changed a lot, either extremely good or sometimes is, is, is very quiet. 
However, uh, the leadership or the commitment of tab holding or tab construction in the business in Saudi, they never uh, uh, use this as an ex excuse not to, to deliver or, or to default in their projects. They had five projects, they continue their commitments, and they delivered three out of five, and there is one in, in, in the coming two months. So the important thing, uh, the, the political side is always there. The events or the conflicts will be always there, and then the role or the, of, of the leaders is the most important thing to try as much as possible, avoid it, and develop that uh, uh, relationship and improve the business between, between the, uh, the companies or the countries. Uh, that is the main angle I would like to, to discuss in, in, this, in this issue. The second point I would like to, to, to, to discuss today is the Saudi-Turkish relationship, which is important because uh, many Saudis come to Turkey and try to do business. At the same time, many Turks come to Saudi and they wouldn't like to do business. However, these initiatives need to have like more of a long-term relationship, more of a goal, more of a plan. So you achieve it. Uh, if you come to Saudi or if I come to Turkey two, three times, then leave, you will never do a business. It's just simply you are trying to do a business, but you will never do it. So there is a long-term relationship, and there is, there is a plan, there is a, a goal you want to achieve it. Saudi and Turkey, in the last uh, two months, they signed an agreement which is called the Strategic Cooperation uh, Relationship, or Council, with a clear goal and, and vision how they want to, talk this, to, to take this relationship between the two countries. Um, as of now, the Saudi investment in Turkey, mainly in, in real estate, and it's around 2 billion US dollars. By 2023, 20, they are targeting to achieve uh, 25 billion US dollars. It's a huge growth in a very short period of time, but at least there is, there is a dedication, there is a team to follow that. The other issue is the trade. The Saudi-Turkey trade is around 7.9 or 8 billion US dollars, and by 2023, 20, they are trying to achieve 20 billion US dollars. This is two simple examples of the uh, long-term relationship with a clear goal and coordination, and do everybody expect the final uh, signing or, or agreement to be signed during the Islamic summit, which we expected to be held in, in, in Istanbul between the 10th and 15th of, of April, hopefully during uh, the visit of the custodian of the two holy mosques, uh, King Salman, uh, as it's been uh, expected. However, nothing been confirmed yet. Um, that, that um, council would like to focus in, in, in business, in uh, education, in health, in military, in defense, and other, uh, other issues. But it is determined with a clear number and a clear uh, uh, uh, uh, goals to be achieved. This is the other, other point I would like to discuss, and maybe I would like to address, because this is important to Saudi. The Turkish business, or the Turkish businessman business in Saudi, it is now in the range of uh, 1.5 billion US dollars. And maybe we all heard recently the uh, Ministry of Housing in Saudi announced uh, uh, an invitation for Turkish real estate developer to develop housing in Saudi, plus other businesses uh, in, in different uh, sectors. So also that is part of the uh, goal, or that is part of the mandate, which is the uh, Strategic Cooperation Council would like to achieve between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. The last point, which is maybe I would like to address, which is the oil prices. And I think the, the, the right thing, I, I don't know how much the oil price is, and if I, I know I will, I will buy oil myself. But I don't think anybody, anybody knows about the oil prices, and um, I, I think the right thing, you think it will be zero, as you said yesterday. Uh, and I think the, the, the, and the companies or the countries will, will need to deal with the, uh, the, the more conservative approach, because you are dealing with countries, you are dealing with people. And uh, what's good about Saudi, what is announced last December, they formed the uh, National Transformation Program where they want to uh, change the main income of Saudi from oil, which is around 90% now, uh, and maybe 90% of the export of Saudi Arabia. So we are very much 
uh, depending in a single uh, income, which is the oil prices, to different sector, and they identify more than 16 sectors where they need to improve and to go for privatization or try to diversify the income. And they announced what is called uh, 2020 uh, vision for Saudi Arabia, and they focused in the three main area. Number one, which is the government, how to improve the government performance with a clear dashboard for all ministries and more than 1,000 KPIs for all ministries watch in monthly basis and every minister or every government body is accountable to achieve these KPIs. The second issue is the society and how to improve and give more attention for the health, for the education, for the training and development. And the third point, which is the uh, companies or the private sectors, where um, focusing uh, public-private uh, uh, partnership, which is the PPP, helping Saudi companies to go international. And as we heard this morning, uh, the Turkish brand is becoming an international name. And there is an effort now to take the Saudi brand to, to be an international brand. And the third point, and plus other points, is making the investment in Saudi more of an attractive environment to facilitate it and make the uh, process and the regulations easy for any investor to come to Saudi to establish a company, direct company, and do the business like the Saudi do. With all uh, that, maybe this is I would like to uh, conclude what I would um, uh, share today. And maybe before I ended, I would uh, thank uh, Mr. Rauf for inviting me for this summit. It was a very interesting opportunity to me to see much of the Turkish uh, businessmen. It was very interesting, uh, all the successful story. And I really uh, would like to see if as a Saudi, I would like to see the Saudi companies going international uh, like the money of the Turkish company, which we heard about it this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you allow me, I'm going to speak uh, in English. Spend our time. However, if you allow me, I would like to request two ministers here. Not the businessmen, because the businessmen, they know. And they, they know what business is about. They're leaders of the business community. But I think they may want to hear one last word from the politicians. And this may be your uh, recommendation or your uh, enlightening words for the Turkish business, say in the next 10 years. So, Mr. Prime Minister. First of all, I think our Saudi friend spoke very wisely about the way how to decrease tensions between Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Iran. I think that is the way for the future, to increase the trade, increase the contacts cross-border. Uh, we have always needed that, but we need that more now than ever, because we know what happens otherwise. Um, I would say to uh, Turkey, and this links a little bit about maybe differences in our view on where European Union are headed. I think it's very important that we accept a European Union with different speeds. And I want to say again that that's partly what you will feel is the discussion in the United Kingdom. They are asking the European Union to be a member without the euro as a currency. Well, that's also true for my country. And if you establish a system, there are 19 of the countries that actually have the euro as a currency, and the rest do not. If you accept that there are divisions, it will also be easier to discuss a Turkish membership inside the European Union, because then we don't say one size fits all and you have to come in exactly as all the rest. I think that would be one of the best investments for the future of Europe, to have Turkey inside the European Union. And that has been a long-standing Swedish position, and we will support you in this, even though, of course, it works both ways. It's reforms in Turkey, and it's also a meeting from, from the European side. And I mean, the negotiations have been ongoing more than 10 years, so, um, and that's a shame um, that it, it's so low, the pace of these negotiations, because it links very much to the questions you've heard here. More open barriers to trade, more openness to trade in the future with free trade agreements, with Iran, other comings, uh, coming into these markets, 
That is what on the sunnier days of European Union are actually trying to achieve. And Turkey should be inside that. And I think that business life, as we have described here, is probably the most important part in taking down the tension, sometimes created by politicians, to make a better situation among people in our countries. Thank you. My turn. Well, uh, on the first point, I would, uh, I would absolutely agree <clears throat> with uh, the previous speaker and <laughs> the former Prime Minister of Sweden that um, uh, Turkey's position is within Europe and the approach must be stable, insistent and flexible so far as the kind of relationship Turkey can establish with the European Union. Uh, I also believe, and I have said before, that the European Union is, is moving naturally into a multi-speed dimension, which will make Turkey's position easier to handle. The second uh, point I wish to make is that uh, Turkey will have any, every interest to maintain the, lib the pace of liberal reforms, opening up the economy, opening up competition, become stronger internationally, globally. Don't be afraid of the foreign world. I think Turkey has a huge development potential, has a young and dynamic population, has very bright entrepreneurs, has all the ingredients besides its geopolitical position to succeed in a globalized economy. So don't be afraid of the outside world. My, my third point is a more controversial one. Uh, leadership, as you know, has two sides. <coughs> the first is the personal quality of the leader, and have been very successful leaders in Turkish history, and I believe the present leader, whatever one thinks about his political convictions, is a, <coughs> a very powerful, dynamic, and creative leader. But on the other hand, uh, leaders do not survive forever, are not eternal, so what stays in are institutions. And by institutions, I mean justice, I mean the army, I mean the public administration. And since we don't know how leaders will succeed each other, it is important to have institutional controls. It is exceptionally important to have institutional controls. The European Union is exerting upon you a very strong pressure to adjust your standards to Europe. So your standards of institutions, your standards regarding the rule of law, your standards regarding human rights. Of course, I do accept cultural differences. I do accept the difference deriving from religion. However, in the humanity, there are some common standards we should all respect. So I would advise you not to take all this European pressure negatively altogether. Of course, you may take a differentiated view. You may have to evaluate. You may have to say yes to something and no to other. But the basic line is right. You may not feel it now because you are very successful, you're a booming economy, you're an emerging superpower, not a, let alone regional power. But sometime in the future, I'm sure you will regret if now you loosened your effort to build strong democratic institutions. Thank you very much indeed. Uzun yoldan gelmiş olan yabancı misafirlerimizden de konuşmalarını kesmemek için. Speeches so far, speakers who came from very uh, far away. Uh, once again, I would like to thank all of our panelists for their enlightening speeches. They honored us. Thank you very much. <gülüyor>